So when the scientists thought of using bacteriophage lambda as vectors, there were a lot of problems initially. And one of the most important problems that the scientists faced was the problem of packaging. Now, if the bacteriophage lambda is given a DNA which is more than 52 kilobase pairs in length, then this DNA cannot be packed into the head of the bacteriophage lambda. Now, to resolve this problem, what the scientists did, they cut short the bacteriophage lambda DNA. How did they do that? They removed some non-essential genes. And specifically, these non-essential genes, they were uh, genes responsible for lysogeny. And more specifically, the genes that were responsible for integration and excision. So, the integration and excision genes that were required for the bacteriophage lambda to integrate into the bacterial genome and excise out of the bacterial genome, those were removed. Now, this um, solved the problem to some extent. Now, after this also, after the, after the integration and excision genes, they were removed, the deleted genome had a lot of restriction sites for a particular restriction enzyme. That is, multiple sites for a single restriction endonuclease. So the second problem was multiple sites for a single restriction endonuclease. Now, this problem was dealt with using a technique which is called in vitro mutagenesis. Now, in vitro mutagenesis, let me explain a little bit. Let's say you have a bacteriophage lambda genome with five restriction endonucleoside for ECOR1 five sites. Now you infect a lawn of E. coli cells with this uh, lambda phage and let's say this is inside the head. This is inside the head. So you infect this lambda phage that is having five restriction sites for ECOR1 and you uh, grow bacteria as a lawn and these bacteria has to have uh, the functional ECOR1. Right? Now, it can be possible that during the growth, these sites, these ECOR1 sites, they can mutate. I mean, the sequence can mutate and some of the sites may be lost and some of the sites may not be recognized by the ECOR1 enzyme that is present in the bacteria, that is secreted by the bacteria. So, if you see, let's say if you see a plaque, so this is the whole bacterial lawn and in it, when you, gr when you grow the, when you infect it with the phage, you see a plaque, a clearing. Now you take out the plaque and there is a possibility that because of uh, natural processing, natural selection and spontaneity, these five ECOR1 sites may be reduced to three. Now the bacteriophage that you have recovered, they're having three ECOR1 sites. Now again, you take this and you infect a lot of bacteria that might reduce, I mean, it is a possibility that it might reduce the sites to one. So, 
this is all depending upon chance it might happen it might not happen right so this is how you can get you can get by natural selection process you can get a bacteriophage lambda that is having only one i mean only one restriction in nucleus site for one restriction in the nucleus now the problem with multiple restriction in the nucleus was that you know you can use the restriction in the nucleus to put in the desired gene of interest but it will cut the lambda into so many pieces that it is going to be very difficult to re-ligate so this was the problem that is why the whole in vitro mutagenesis was thought of so this can be one way now this was in a very infancy stage so the scientists they doubled around a little bit more and they came up with two different types of vectors for bacteriophage lambda so the first one was called insertional vectors now insertional vectors are bacteriophage lambdas that have been modified and they possess only one restriction endonuclease site for one particular restriction endonuclease so this restriction endonuclease site it is unique so let's say this is the um, this is the genome this is the genome of the uh, bacteriophage lambda and over here you have the restriction endonuclease site this is the restriction endonuclease site so you can cut this you can cut open this you can ligate your gene and you can put it inside the dna i mean put it inside the head of the um, bacteriophage lambda and infect e coli cells for further processing okay so one example of this insertional vector was lambda gt10 so lambda gt10 it can carry up to 8 kilobase pair of new dna new dna i mean apart from the lambda dna you can insert up to 8 kilobase pair into the vector and you can put it uh, you can put it inside the head of the lambda phage and it has this lambda gt it has one unique eco r1 site inside the c1 gene this c1 gene this is responsible for the lysogeny for the induction of the lysogeny so the c1 gene basically if this is the c1 gene let's say this is the c1 gene then the eco r1 site is somewhere in between the c1 gene this is the c1 eco r1 site is somewhere in between so you open up the c1 gene and you put your dna of interest inside it and hence the c1 gene becomes non functional non functional and because the c1 gene becomes non functional there won't be any turbid plaques turbid plaques absent because every time when you do this the c1 gene would be non functional and the bacteriophage lambda would always go into lytic phase that is why there won't be any turbid plaques instead there there will be all clear plaques so every time it is going to go into lytic phase because the lysogeny gene the main gene that is responsible for the lysogeny is absent is non functional so 
This was the insertional vector, where you are inserting your DNA of interest. When uh, you're cutting open the uh, cutting open a part of the lambda lambda genome, and you're inserting your DNA of interest. So the other type, the other type, was the replacement vector. Replacement or substitution vector. So the replacement or substitution vectors, this is a little bit different from the uh, insertion of vectors, where if this is a stretch of the lambda DNA, then the lambda DNA is going to contain two restriction sites, two restriction sites for the same restriction enzyme. So basically what you're doing, you're cutting it over here, you're cutting it over here, and you're removing, you are, you're removing the segment in between, and you are putting your gene of interest in place of that segment. So this is now my gene of interest. So you're replacing a chunk of the DNA and you are replacing it with your gene of interest. So the DNA that is being replaced that was originally part of the uh, lambda molecule that is called the stuffer sequence or the stuffer region, whatever you call it. So the stuffer region is between the two restriction sites and this is removed and your gene of interest is placed inside uh, inside the place where the stuffer region was present. Now a classic example of the replacement or substitution vector for lambda is the lambda EMBL4. Now this lambda EMBL4, this can take up 20 KB of DNA as insert. Then take up 20 KB as insert. And it has got two restriction sites, each for ECOR1, BAMH1, and SAL1. So two restriction sites for each of them and they're placed in uh, placed in somewhat like this so if your if your ecor1 is over here your bamh1 is let's say this is the first restriction site this is the second restriction site and this is the third restriction site it is going to be in the same manner but in opposite but in opposite direction on the other side this would be the first this would be the second and this is going to be the third. Because you can use either of the three restrictions. If you use the first, it's going to take out this part. If you use the second, it is going to take out this part. And if you use the third, it is going to take out this part. Now, depending on your gene of interest, I mean, your uh, size of the gene of interest, you can choose which restriction enzyme to cut the DNA with. And that was it about the different vectors that can be used for uh, lambda bacteriophage. Now I'm going to be linking some of the other videos over here and one of the videos would be the um, in vitro packaging of lambda DNA or lambda vector. You can watch that, you can have a detailed explanation of the in vitro packaging with that and I'm going to be also putting a link to the series that I did on computational biology, that is biology with Python, that is a very uh, new thing that you can learn. And until the next time.